For my next video, I'm going to talk about keeping your dogs in, in shape or keeping them fit. Uh, nothing intended for legal purposes, all history and past. And uh, this can apply to today, too. Part of this comes from uh, a post that was put up uh, by Ron Dogma. And I forget, I'm sorry, but I forget who he got it from. But it had to do with uh, Carver put out a an article uh, talking about, you know, when he tested his dogs to see if they were good enough to compete with. And uh, it was good, you know. He fed how he fed in that time. And it was a process of what he did and how he worked them and did this and that. And what weight he had them at close to their weight before he checked them, you know. And uh, it was something that wasn't done by most people, but certain people did do that. And Carver went through the process of doing that, you know. He used some unorthodox things or people would think would be unorthodox, like tomato juice, you know. Uh, the acid in there, some people find that not uh, not to go well with the dogs, you know. And for anything you give them, you know, do your research. I mentioned this before. Check uh, Mayo Clinic website. Check Merck Veterinary website. See what things are good for dogs, medicine, a lot of different stuff. Anyways, uh, that was Carver's method. And like I said, not a lot of people did it, you know. Uh, back in the day, uh, Tudor, Nemechek, you know, maybe even Sadler, I don't know. But some people always had their dogs fit. And I was guessed that during the early 1900 to the mid 1900s, they did that more so because, uh, you know, they had a lot of off the chain stuff or short uh, keeps, you know. Tudor advertised that he could have a dog ready in 10 to 30 days. Most of the keeps back then that you research, you know, whether it's Armitage or someone else, uh, were 30-day keeps, you know. And sometimes they had the dogs pretty heavy, you know, up to 10 pounds over their weight. So they had their methods from bringing them down in weight rapidly, you know. They used this, this stuff called, it was uh, some kind of water, not rose water, but it was, uh, I forget. Uh, you know, that's how my memory is. But it was it was water, almost like a diuretic that would cut their weight real fast, you know. And, uh, and, you know, in my day, it just, you know, when I first started getting dogs, I just thought it was pertinent. I thought it made sense to exercise my dogs regularly. I always done that, even before I knew how to do a good keep or even before I got real heavy into it, you know. And I always did that before I schooled my dogs. I just had them that way, you know. Uh, it just made sense, regular exercise. Along with teaching them how to do my keep or using other things that I didn't use in my keep, like a spring pole or tug of war or flirt pole or swimming, you know. Then my kids, with all the stuff they did with the dogs, you know, school baby taught a couple of our dogs to climb trees and uh, you take them you know, out in the fields and run them when they're pups. You can run them loose, you know, like that. And uh, I always had my dogs close to weight. And in the summertime, I had them either at weight, sometimes below weight. Reason for that, it gets real hot here. You know, I didn't want to have a lot of, a lot of weight on them because <clears throat> they could suffer from heat stroke, you know. Uh, because if they're active, you know, Sometimes the, the hot weather makes them settle down more. Sometimes when it's real, real cold, they won't get out much. But there are dogs that, that that don't matter. They'll still run around. You know, I have pics of BJ, for instance. He would dig big old craters, you know, in the ground, dig and dig and dig big old holes, you know, and he would bite the dirt and just do that every day. And every day I would go out and sweep the dirt back into the hole and he would do it the next day, you know, almost like he was digging to China. 
but I had to have him real thin. And in the pics that I've posted of him on my, in my group, you can see, you know, like his hip bones, you can see his backbone. You can see some, some weight on him, but he was, he was sometimes, like I said, he was below weight because I didn't want them to get, you know, a heat stroke. I could take them out because of where I lived. I could take them out and run them next to my bike, even during the summertime because of the uh, orchards that were around, you know. Even though it was hot, it, they were shaded because of the big trees, you know, big almond trees around. So I didn't do that a lot. I didn't stress them a lot doing that, you know. And then when I bring them back, you know, I'd cool them down, either put water on them or put some alcohol in the area, you know, their armpits and in between their back legs and their groin and like that to cool them down, you know. You just, you don't want to overstress them, you know. That's the whole thing because that heat alone can kill them and it doesn't take long. I had a, a dog that happened to one time, a very good dog. Uh, another dog got off the chain, got to him. The dog on the chain ended up dying because not so much from the damage done but just from being overheated you know they were screaming at each other and hollering like that and you know he was already worked up got hot and it was actually the heat that killed him i didn't even think at the time hey go put him in the bathtub run water on him you know might have saved his life you know that was early on in my career where i didn't have a lot of knowledge but keeping him fit is important it helps them even as they grow older, you know, because they, they'll live longer, because they're healthier. And doing this regular exercise thing, along with good feed and some supplements, if you want to do that, you know, uh, that's part of their constitution that's built up over generations. So they're tough, durable, active, good work ethic, you know. And uh, basically, uh, what I would do is, you know, and, and part of this too, which meant, you know, if I was schooling a dog or rolling a dog or whatever, speaking of the past, you know, they were always ready. I didn't have to, uh, I didn't have to, to worry about what weight they were, were, what weight they were, because they were already close to weight anyways. Even the ones that weren't competition dogs, I didn't keep them heavy. It's good for females when they come in heat, you know, if they're down in weight and exercised, uh, they'll have a, an easier pregnancy, an easier labor, you know. Even though when they get pregnant, you pork the food to them, you know, I still exercised them while they were pregnant, just like they advise women to do, you know. Exercise and it'll help in your labor, help with the pregnancy, all that, stay fit. And, you know, the reason for that is because they're athletes. They come from competition dogs. So athletes generally stay active, you know. Doesn't mean hard work. Doesn't mean putting them through a key. Doesn't mean even doing anything timed, you know, workouts or anything like that. It's just to keep them fit and it helps keep them loose too, you know. Uh, loose meaning you know, you won't have any problems with tendons and joints and pulled muscles and torn pads, you know, uh, no, and getting them off the chain, getting them out there, you know, you know, when you do that, uh, it, it, uh, you avoid injuries, you know, you avoid torn pads because their pads are tough because you take them out and run them or you flirt pull them on their chain or they run their chain area. Some people would, would have, uh, you know, cable runs, you know, 75 feet, 100 foot cable runs, whatever it is. And that alone keeps the dog active, you know. It's got all that space to run. If you have a high-spirited dog like that, he's going to exercise da almost daily anyways, you know. Uh, if you find yourself with a dog that's just crazy and and runs all day, you know, you can bring that dog in at night and put him in a crate inside your house, you know, a sky kennel inside your house, just so he'll rest all night long and then take him out late in the morning, early in the morning, whatever you want to do, you know. Later you take, take him out, the less time they have to run all day long, you know. 
And like I said, some of them dogs would do that in the heat. So I, because of that, those dogs, I would have them real thin, you know. And they were always fed good, so it wasn't a nutrition thing. They weren't weak, and they weren't starved, right? Because they had all the nutrients they needed, all the vitamins, minerals, protein, fat, all that. Just less of it. And they would work their self down to weight and always keep them hydrated, you know. Uh, that that's, that's very important, too. Because during all that work, you know, they'll have a tendency to start drying themselves out. So you just put it in their feed bowl. You know, during the wintertime, I usually gave them broth, warm broth in their feed. Uh, and during the summertime, we would just put cool water, you know, to make sure they're hydrated during the uh, summertime, you know. So uh, doing that, you know, and it's just a matter of, of you can take them out and walk them. You can take them out and run them. You can put them on a mill for a couple of minutes. You can spring pull them in their chain area, you know, for a few minutes. And that, that I like that a lot because I would just go from one dog to the next. And while you're flirt pulling, I didn't mean spring pull, I meant flirt pull. While you're, you can flirt pull each dog in their chain area. So while you're flirt pulling one, He's getting that good workout, and it only has to be for a few minutes. But while you're doing that, the other ones are excited, running around too. Then you go to the next one, they get their attention. Everybody else is jumping around. So even though you're doing each one for a couple of minutes, you could be out there for a half hour, 45 minutes, depending on how many dogs you got, or an hour or whatever. And they're going to get that much, almost that much workout time. Because, you know... They're going to, some of them will just pace, wait in their turn. Some of them will run the circle. Some will run and jump on their house, jump off their house, like that, right? And then the routine was, once I'm done with that, uh, I make sure and wait till it, the dogs have cooled down, cooled off, stop all that activity. Then I would go through and make sure they had water to drink. Because, like I said in other videos, you know, to keep them from chewing their bowl, we would just take the bowl away. We would just have it outside their area and just water them three or four times a day, you know. Uh, in the cold, cooler weather, you know, uh, sometimes they won't even drink water. Or they might drink it one time or two times, but not three or four times a day because they're hydrated, right? But in that action, I would wait. Till they were all cooled down because if you give them water right away they're going to lap it up they're going to drink too much they're going to puke their self you know it's kind of that concept where you hear people that are you know dying of thirst in the desert if you give them water you know and they drink too much it can actually kill them and there's stories recorded where that happened you know there's one story these miners were out in the desert and they were dehydrated and dying of thirst Right, they finally got a hold of some water, and one of the guys drank too much, and he actually died from it. The other two or three guys that were with him didn't. They didn't die, but he died from drinking that drinking too much of that water. And if you watch the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, that Clint Eastwood movie, you'll see Duco where Clint Eastwood's dying of thirst, you know, and he gives him the water, and he tells him, "Not too much, not too much is not good for you." You know, that's where that concept comes from. So if you do that with your dogs when they're heated up and active like that. Uh, it could cause them some damage too. I don't know the process. I don't know the science behind it, but I know, it, 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 you know, that it can harm them if they drink too much water when they're heated up. Right. So I always waited for them to cool down, then went to each one, and I had help. You know, I had my wife and the kids out there. We just give them water, even the way I fed. You know, I would get the food ready. One kid would be there. Give the pan to one food, tell them, feed this dog, feed Big Red. This one goes through, and just rotate them like that. They go and feed one, send the next one out, you know, and the next kid, I had three, you know, and go like that, rotate them. The other one come back, okay, this goes to Lucy, this goes to Sissy, this goes to Miss Rowdy, that like that, just rotate them like that. So it was quick. That way the dogs aren't barking all for an, half an hour, you know, waiting for their feed. And, uh, you know, some of mine, they weren't noisy during 
feed time or even that exercise time, they would just run, you know, run their chain waiting, pacing back and forth waiting, you know. We tried to keep them quiet, even though we lived out in the country, you know. I didn't want them hollering all day, making them, making a bunch of noise all day long for no reason, you know. Uh, even if something got loose or a, or some varmint or something got new there next to their uh, chain area, they learned enough or they knew enough not to be barking at and screaming at and trying to get to it. Most of them, you know, they would they would patiently wait till they got in their area and then snatch it up. You know, that hunting instinct, you know, where, where they're waiting for the prey and then they pounce on it. They would do that, too. They weren't the type to really holler and scream if a chicken came by, you know, they would wait and wait and wait, put themselves in a position, back themselves up where they have room to run at the chicken in their area. Rather than having the chain taut, you know, uh, they would have it loose, so give them, give them some running space to grab the chicken or the rabbit or whatever came through. So, you know, when you, when you live out in the country like that, anything can come by. You know, it could be a possum, a rac not a raccoon, but a possum or a, or a uh, you know, rabbit, squirrels. Could be gophers around, you know, out in the field. Uh, and they'll, they'll smell them, you know, and dig them up. So it helps their instincts, you know. So that was the reason why, and I mentioned before too, you know, I didn't really pre-keep my dogs. Their whole life was a pre-keep. So by the time they get up to year and a half, two years old, I was kind of, I kind of knew what their weight was going to be. And you kind of get that instinct for picking close to their weight, what it's going to be. You know, when, you, when you're breeding dog, you're raising dogs, and you see, <clears throat> you know, as they grow how big they are, how small they are, how big they're going to be, what weight they're going to stay at, you know, where they look good at, you know. And uh, if your dog's fit most of the time, you know, he's got good muscle, got a little bit of fat. So you judge their weight and uh, it's mostly what they're going to weigh when they're dried out, right? Not dehydrated dried out that that most of that weight that you're taking off is moisture at the at the end of the keep it's not fat right so for example let's say they're two pounds uh over their weight you know they're pretty much down in weight so during the keep you're going to cut a little bit of fat but you're going to build muscle too so there's that kind of trade-off you're bringing them down, cut the little fat that they have, right? Getting rid of the moisture that's in them, but you're building muscle too. So it's kind of, you're taking weight off, you're adding weight with the muscle like that. And you just kind of get an eye for it. But like I said, it was, it's, it was important to have them fit because in my mind, they're athletes anyways, you know? And I got that from several boxers that I used to pay attention to that always stayed close close to their match weight, you know, whether it was a 35 pounder or 60 pounder, you know, 160, 135, 175, you know, the ones that stayed close to their weight and did their own regular exercise seemed to have more longevity, you know, and especially those that didn't have to cut weight real fast to take a fight on short notice or, you know, they screw around and don't train properly, you know, and they have to hurry up and get in shape and lose a lot of weight, you know. Those are the ones that seem to suffer long-term injuries, including mental injuries, you know. You fight out of shape, you fight uh, too heavy, you know, put a lot of stress and a lot of damage on your body. Or those that are more fit for their, during their careers, those ones seem to suffer less physical and mental damage, right. So I felt that way with my dogs too, you know. Uh, even as they got older, you know, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, whatever it was, they really didn't have a lot of white hairs, and they really didn't suffer long-term injuries, you know, except for a couple of them that had, they had injuries that couldn't be, you know, you couldn't, you, it's hard to fix broken legs and stuff like that. Not fix them, fix them, but it's hard to not have long-term uh effects from certain 
you know, injuries, you know. It's like, you know, if you get half your ear chewed off, you're not going to grow a ear, you know, <laughs> like that. Kind of, a, you know, that kind of deal, you know. You have, they have bits and pieces missing from their muscle or sometimes you lose a toe, you know. Again, I'm speaking of the past. Those kind of things you can't do anything about, right? But their health, constitution, vitality, you know, you can. And plus, it, it keeps them from being bored, you know. And during my keep, I really didn't use a treadmill, but I had a treadmill for a lot of years just to, you know, give them something to do, just to exercise them, you know. They preferred the open road and the road work far more than, than any treadmill, no matter whether I baited them or, or whatever it was on the treadmill, you know. They just like getting out and running around, you know. And let's say you live in the city. You don't have... That's but you can't go on a bike, you know, or it doesn't it doesn't suit your situation. Too many neighbors, too much public, and all that. Even if you have a small yard, you know, you can flirt pole them in the yard, you know, if it's if it's separated from other dogs. If you have other dogs, or let's say you have three or four dogs and they're in kennel runs in your house, you know, you can if you're working one dog or you're exercising one dog you can put the other two three inside your garage or inside a room with in a sky kennel and just do your little exercise with the one you're doing it and rotate them like that you know you can flirt pole them you can have your spring pole there you don't have to leave the other dogs out if you don't have a bunch of them where they're hooping and hollering making a bunch of noise watching the other dog work you can put them up just have that quiet environment or you can toss a ball around kick a, uh, a, a soccer ball or a, or a big rubber ball or a basketball or whatever, you know, and let the dog just run it, you know. Use, uh, you know, I used to sit, just sit in one spot and have a couple of, have a couple of tennis balls, you know, throw one. And once you get into the, into the frame of it, into the, where the dog understands, he's gonna catch that ball. He may wanna sit over there and chew. <laughs> You know, and just stay where he's at on that end of the yard, chewing that, tearing that, that uh, tennis ball up, right? But if you show him the other one, he's going to come back. So he's either going to drop the tennis ball where he's at, or he's going to come back with the tennis ball in his hand, in his mouth, right? You just throw the other one. He'll either drop it, or he'll go over there and chase the other one, drop one, and grab the, the new one, like that. And if you have kids like me, you just have them out there, hey, bring me the ball. So, you know, I really didn't have to move, you know, I could sit pretty much. I mean, if I did get up, you know, it is good exercise for me walking around the yard and chasing the dog, you know, it takes time. They're going to chew up some tennis balls, so you buy a bunch of them, just replace them as they chew them up, you know. But you can get into that routine. You can teach the dog to do that kind of work, you know. And like I said, if you have a little spring pole, you can do that. You have two dogs next to each other in a, in a, uh, you know, doing the tug of war thing. They can do that. Some will do that for a long time. They'll do it as long as you leave it. And I used uh, old Levi pants, you know, because they, they, they can close their mouth, breathe through their nose. That's one benefit of it, you know. Uh, they'll, they'll pull it and pull it and it'll slip out of their mouth you know and if you're done with your workout you know and it slips out or you think hey that's enough I'll take advantage of this situation then it's just a matter of breaking one dog off rather than try and break two dogs off you know so uh you know it's just a matter of figuring things out what you want to do but keep them fit you know and I did that so Anytime I wanted to roll them or someone else wanted to roll with me, I was ready to go. And I didn't, you know, sometimes you get some backlash. Well, it's not fair. You work your dog and I didn't. And I'd tell them you should work yours too. You can bring them in however you want. No reason for you to have them heavy. Even just cutting back on their feet a little bit, you know. They don't need that, a lot of feed like that. They don't need a lot of supplements, a lot of power boosting powder or whatever that stuff is, you know, or high concentrated whatever, fat and all that stuff. You know, they, they don't need a lot of that if they're not in keep or if you're just, they're just, you know, uh, 
you know, on the chain like that, you know. If you're getting ready for an event, that's different. I've covered a lot of that in the conditioning videos. But just daily routine, daily feed, you know, they're good. Even if you want to feed twice a day, you split it up. You give them half in the morning, half at night, you know, like that. But it doesn't have to be a lot. They don't have to be fat. It's not good for them. It's not healthy for them. You're not doing them any favors. It's actually a detriment when you keep them heavy like that. I see that in a lot of pictures. I can see the fat on their body. You can see when they move, it rolls back and forth, you know. It's just it's too heavy and too much. Not good for them. So again, little video was suggested, plus, like I said, it came up in the, in the, uh, uh, in my group. So I thought I'd cover a little bit, you know. Uh, protein and fat, that's what they need. Cut back the fat a little more when, during the summertime and add a little more fat to uh, to their feed during the wintertime. And if you're giving them a high protein, high fat diet, like some of these uh, feeds, you know, kibble or whatever, and it's, you know, let's say it's 21 fat and 28 protein, you know, they need to have exercise because that's a, that's, high high concentrate of those two ingredients for them to just be sitting around laying around or having them too heavy so hope you enjoy the vid feel free to comment thanks for all your support and if you want to get a hold of me for merch or or registering your dogs you know hit me up on facebook messenger or my email richard j60 richard j schoolboy60 at gmail.com or on instagram or if you have my phone number, just call me. You know it. Thank you.